you, God, for tonight that we are not just able to come in and worship, Lord, that we come not just willingly, Lord, but with, Lord, hearts set ready, God, to receive from you tonight. And Lord, we have not only sensed your presence, but God, we've, we've been saturated by it, Lord, that tonight, Lord, that we wouldn't leave this place the same as we came. God, that each and every one of us, Lord, you would begin to change us, Lord, through, through the worship, through your word, God, through our time together. And we just thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. I know the youth are being dismissed back to, to youth service tonight, 12 years old and up capped off at 18 so I saw Bill Bill was about to head back there but I'll clarify well, well take time to worship and giving uh, just want to remind you of any commitments that you've made to missionaries uh, that you're fulfilling that and uh, if you don't, if you want to give to missions and you don't have a particular missionary that you sought out you can put 555 on there and guaranteed your money will be split between uh, over 55, now it's more than 55, I believe, but over 55 missionaries that are all out of Arkansas. So you can just simply check or on the offering envelope put 555 missions, uh, number 555, and uh, that will go uh, divided up. So right now we're giving $5 a month for every Arkansas missionary until the funds as long as the funds are being replenished, we're, we're doing that monthly. So, all right. One of you gentlemen, want to pray? So a couple of things I want to tell you, exciting news. Uh, number one is this Sunday we will start live streaming our services. So we've got the equipment in for that and we'll begin live streaming. So we've been recording them and putting them on uh, the website and uh, links on Facebook. But now you'll actually be able to join the services live. So that, thank you, Nathan, for getting that going. Uh, parents also. Uh, there are a few more changing table stations for those in diapers now. Now uh, Nathan got, and uh, his mom Suzette got those put in yesterday, I think. Um, but they are in, or today, but they are in the ha uh, handicapped stalls in both the men's and women's bathrooms, as well as one in the nursing mothers or crying babies rooms. So we have three stations. Um, we do keep the kids area locked when there's not kids activities planned there, um, when we don't have them scheduled. Uh, so now you have a place for changing tables as well. Well, Jennifer and I just got back today from our Arkansas District Council for the Assemblies of God in Arkansas, and it was great to connect with ministers that I only get to see sometimes once a year. And uh, it was really a, a great time. Um, uh, Pastor Cheney from Rogers for Assembly, his son, uh, Josh, who is their youth leader, was ordained went through ordination, as well as Kyle Coslett, who is the youth pastor at Decatur Assembly God Church. Uh, those two that uh, some may be familiar with were ordained at the ordination service last night. So uh, we're thankful for God bringing us back safe. We drove through some of that storm. but Also keep in mind the annual harvest celebration, or some people might know it more as a business meeting, but we're having that on Sunday, September 19th. And it is from 4.30 to 6 p.m., hour and a half. You do not have to be a partner to be in that. If you want to be a partner, let me know because I am getting ready to start a class. I'm trying to get scheduled. We already have at least uh, three to five individuals, uh, well, a couple. And uh, so anyway, let me know so we can get you in on that class and help you become a partner uh, before that meeting. Uh, I don't know for sure that we'll have anything to vote on this one. There may be a couple adjustments to some bylaws we may consider changing at a time, but it's still good if you can if you want to be a partner, 
to get done before that meeting so we can get you on the partnership roll for that meeting. We do have to have one third of our partners there to actually have a quorum to have a meeting. So if you are a partner, please be there. Um, all right, I think. And uh, I think everybody in here is familiar with what's going on with sabbatical the 26th. So we'll, we'll forgo that announcement tonight. But, well, we've been in a sermon series on the spiritual gifts. This is the sixth, the sixth part. And I want to start this by saying that, you know, in preparing for this, my realization is, is that language, communication is, if not the most, one of the most powerful tools God has given us besides our free will and the ability to love. How many that are married ha, ha, realize that communication is almost everything? All the problems are rooted. All the successes are rooted. The, the highs and the lows almost always revolve around communication. In the church body, it is communication that either trips us up or helps us do well. Um, we're just, you know, communication sets up expectations. Like we're talking, uh, you know, the guys that come around CentOS, the company comes and puts our paper towels for service. I was talking to a few people that we always keep these keys for them in a certain location and in a certain place. And uh, so they go to look in that and they didn't check the place right next to it because they always go and it was right there, but it was actually right next to it. And, you know, when you communicate to somebody, hey, you can find something here, our minds just go to, I've been told this is where it's going to be. When it's not there, we just kind of stop and be like, well, well. Something's awry, right? I'm not going to look any further because it's just not where it's been for the last 10 weeks or whatever it is or 10 months. Communication is difficult. You know, communication was so important in Scripture. If you remember the account of the Tower of Babel, what was the issue with the Tower of Babel? What, was it really the problem that they were going to reach heaven? Was that God's, I don't want you to defeat me. You might build it all the way up there and take over heaven. Was that his concern? No. It was that they were doing it on their own without God. In the mix. They were doing this, and because of the unity, being able to speak all the same language, what did God do to level the playing field? To fuse their languages. You know, I even forget to preach on that account very often, but it is very, very significant because when we've been in the spiritual gifts, tonight I want to talk about the gift of speaking in tongues because it took me some years, but probably about three, four, maybe five years ago, the connection between those two really started to, to get into my spirit. We started with one language on this planet. Have you ever, have you thought about that? We started, God created Adam and Eve. We started and civilization began with one language. And because of one major event, God added the other languages. What we accept as normal, and that's just, hey, people are in different countries, different nationalities, different languages. You know, distance and separation, we learn to communicate different. You know, if you're talking to an atheist, they're going to put that on, well, people that were, you know, came crawling out of the ocean in different areas of the world just begin to figure out their own way to speak. We've been focusing on 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, 7 through 11, where it goes through, and I've read through this so many times, but it's that to each is given a certain gift. We've gone through different gifts, and last time is on miracles and on healing. And, but tonight, when we're looking at these, we have to understand that it's not that we're trying to find this exhaustive list of all the gifts that God has, is, is able to give us, but to understand the ones that he, is, he has told us about here, to fully understand them. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want to start with tongues. The text says various kinds of tongues. And there are several ways in Scripture that the gifts of tongues are in operation. 1 Corinthians 14 starting in verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Follow the way of love. There's a connection already. We know one of the greatest things we can do is love your God and love your neighbor, right? And 
The connection is very strong here, right at the beginning. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. This is not something that's just saying, hey, a suggestion for you, if you want to be better than the other Christians, is to do this. This is to everyone who believes that you should be on a path, your desire, you should be working towards your desire for spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. If any of these kids in here that are under age seven, where they come up with the best questions, right, have been in any of these services where someone's spoken tongues, maybe they haven't, but I would dare say if it didn't come up then, it's come up before, is what were they saying, daddy? For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Is the scripture now trying to diminish the power and the validity and the necessity of speaking in tongues? No. What it's telling us is, listen, all of this only matters if you get something out of it. I'm not saying personally just get something out, but it edifies the body. If, if there is something it produces, that makes sense. So therefore, it's not for the fuzzy doodads on our back to feel good that we, hey, I spoke in tongues. And that's the danger in the Pentecostal circles that we get so focused on it. We talk about it like it's a commodity. And boy, if they just got the speaking in tongues, their life would be so much better. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. And I think this is, I don't think, I know this is where I land. I would like for every single one of y'all to speak in tongues. Well, Pastor CJ, why don't you talk about every Sunday? Why don't you get up and snort and run some pews? And maybe spit a little harder when you talk so some of that anointing fall on <laughs> people. Why don't you do something about that? Well, you know, I've talked about my, I'm a little gun shy about been around some of the charismatic, what I called wackos when I was younger, that, that tried to do it under their own power. That It was obvious that they were trying to put something on. I, that's not holding me back anymore, really. I think I got over that a long time ago. The thing is, I, I cannot give you a gift from God. God can give you a gift from God. And you have to have the desire, back to verse 1, follow the way of love, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You have to pray and ask God to give you the desire. I've learned in my life, if I don't desire something, Scripture says desire, I don't desire, I can't just turn that on like a faucet. Oh, yeah, I forgot, I need to desire this. Geek. Oh, I want that so bad. Sometimes my spirit, I've let myself get so busy. I've let myself get so wound up in things. And in my life, I've just gotten my priorities all mixed up or I'm just wearing myself out and I'm not focusing on God. And I don't have a desire there because I'm just worn out, focused on my own things. I have to stop for a moment and say, God, I am messed up right now. My priorities, my desires are messed up. I need a desire for, your, for what you have for me. And be ready for how he answers that. He may pull some things out from under you to get, your, get, get those things out of the way that have been taking up your focus. So I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you rather have you prophesy. If truly the Lord speaks through you a prophecy, something prophetic for someone in the church or for the church body, I agree, I would rather you because getting direct marching orders from a prophetic word or giving something that is breaking some bondage in my life is far more valuable to the whole church. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets. All right, so here's how it equals out. Prophecy is better if you're just comparing tongues to prophecy. So we could have a bunch of tongue talkers in here speaking tongues every service. But if we have those that can interpret, then here's where things change. Unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So he can, the church can be edified through tongues when there is an interpretation. Otherwise, we have to look at, then if I speak in tongues in my prayer closet, what's the purpose of that? 
And we're going to get to that. There are two different uses of the gift of tongues. So now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Verse 7, even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as a flute or a harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? If you just keep tooting a horn, Blenda, just, just one note forever. Gets annoying, doesn't it? You take a musical instrument, not that I did that in band, third <laughs> last chair, trumpet, but if I kept doing that. You know, I saw a YouTube video as animals responding to musical instruments, and this farmer went out, and he was uh, looking out and probably could see at least 10 to 15 acres clear and just a little ridge and horizon, and he sat down with a trombone and started playing a little tune. Have you seen that one? And all of a sudden, this mass of cows <laughs> looked like he was going to get stampeded. They all come running up, and they start filtering around, and they all just kind of crowd around and listen. How big is a cow's brain? They pretty much think I'm going to eat slobber and drink the water with the slobber in it. That's about all they do, right? They even understand there's something, there's something attractive about when those musical instruments are playing different tunes. And it says, even the case of a lifeless thing that makes sounds such as a flute or harp, how will anyone know what, is, what tune is being played unless there's a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? If I had been asked to be a bugler to lead our troops, I really think it'd make a difference to how they fought compared to if Blenda had been asked to be the bugler. One would be majestic and they might get some fight in them. The other would be like, oh, good grief. Well, I was excited. <laughs> so it is with you. Verse 8, if again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? Verse 9, so it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am, for, I am a foreigner to the speaker and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. That means there's an effort there. It's telling you have to try. You're not sitting on autopilot waiting for the Holy Spirit to come zap you with his ray gun and levitate you a few feet, and then you run around like a crazy person giving out a special gift. That means that as you devour God's word and learn about the spiritual gifts, you pray, give me a desire for this, and as the desire builds, you have to put an effort ahead to not only do them, but to try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. See, this is a whole lot more than what I believe sometimes growing up in, in church camps and all about how the Holy Spirit was supposed to work. I truly guess I thought that you do just sit there and if you just pray enough and you get excited enough, then you get zapped and then you'll do something in service and you go and that's what everybody wanted you to do. That's our whole point of meeting is if somebody gets excited in the service and runs around and hoops and hollers, the Holy Spirit was there and we, we feel like we're having revival. But I have to ask myself, what is Scripture telling us is the whole purpose of this? What, what should be happening? Verse 13, for this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among the, those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. That feels like bragging. 
kind of messed with me a little bit. I, I think God has to speak in tongues more. I, I'm so humble. I wish you all were as humble as I, right? <laughs> I think God ought to speak in tongues. I, I guess what I see from this, because I, I don't think that's the heart in which it's said is a prideful heart. I think what I see in this is that the writer finds that he has received great benefit in his spiritual life and in working with others and ministering to others through the gift of speaking in tongues. He's wanting us to understand that this truly is something to be desired. Here's someone that they look to as a spiritual giant says, I praise God, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Verse 19, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And this is where we get messed up in Pentecostal circles where we pray and beat our brows and do beat our chests and run around hoping everybody gets to speaking in tongues and we have a service, but nobody really walks away doing anything with that. And I say, then it's hogwash that we are seeking. We're seeking for the wrong reasons because we should all be leaving here with something intelligible to apply to our lives. Verse 20, brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. All the way back to the garden. This verse 20 takes us all the way back to the garden. How so? In regard to evil, be infants. You can eat from any tree except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, um, in listening to Ravi Zacharias, he talks about uh, a friend of his where he had visited prison camps uh, uh, from the Holocaust, but he'd never been to Auschwitz, which is a death camp, and it's different. He talked about his friend and said, no, you haven't really seen the atrocities until you visit there. And he went there and he said, it was just inevitable. Room by room they went through as they looked at what the, the, the atrocities happened in photos. It was just silence, pin drop silence. But he said one of the things that was most crushing that just brought tears is, that there is still behind glass 14,000 pounds of women's hair. Just a drop in the bucket what was still there. But because we have kids in the room, I won't go into detail, but you know what they were doing there and that they thought that they are going in for one thing. And what Rabbi Zacharias says that philosophers have determined that the evil that we are capable of, humans are capable of that happened there, did not was not designed in the defense department of the German military. But it was learned through the podiums and the lecture halls of the universities and other places. That the communication of knowledge, there are certain things God never wanted us to know. God never intended, he wanted us to be like children. He stresses that greatly, how the kingdom of heaven is children. We, we think it's so good for us to know everything. And let me tell you something. I know everybody gets tired of me harping on this and think that I don't care what's going on with our government and the news media and all this stuff. But I'm going to tell you, I know from what I was taught as a kid that what I fill my mind with will produce something in my life, positive, negative, or indifferent. And that in those lecture halls, just enough of that evil, just enough of that pumped in their mind, just enough of that produced something so horrific. And what happens to our hearts when we allow ourselves to, to, to instead of like a child, try to retain some of our innocence, but we want to know every bit of atrocity, every bit of evil out there, every bit. If I'm just informed, it will protect me. But that's not what God wanted because the tempter said, you'll be like God. You want to protect yourself from dying, you need to know about these things. You want to protect yourself, you need to know. But in verse 20, brothers, stop thinking like children in regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking be adults. In the law it's written, through men, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. 
Tongues then are a sign for non-believers, for the unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not from believers. Have we maybe put focus on, if we just had everybody speaking in tongues among all the believers in here, that we were going to have a revival? Or is it that we've caught this thing mixed up? I, I am fully, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues as the initial physical evidence of speaking tongues. Not because I'm an aging minister, because I believe it. Because I believe in the scriptural basis for it. Because I believe that's the way God designed it. I believe that as God breathed. But motives can change whether we experience revival or not because we might be trying to motivate the wrong thing. I know some pastors have taken some pretty hard hits from believers because they, in their churches, to drive the right focus, have said, in this main service, we are asking you to, that we're not operating in the gift of tongues interpretation here and that's where people's ears just go, oh, Antichrist. Without even hearing the after. No, we do small groups. We teach when people are experienced. And they have more, some of those churches have more people filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking tongues. And all these churches that haven't had anybody filled the Holy Spirit speaking tongues in years are the first ones to say, no, no, that's not how it works, brother. No, 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 you can't ever say you can't have it in that service. Well, they're learning that in our culture, when someone speaks in tongues and, and if there's not an interpretation or if that person is not uh, taught in that way, that they, they stand in there and they're like, I don't know what's going on and they're confused and they're like, I, I've had enough of this. And we've had people get up and run out the back door. And I, I agree that I cannot change what we teach or do because of someone running out the door. But I'm saying when you look at Scripture and you see what our focus should really be on, it should be on intelligible words being launched into the hearts of people from God through us, through gifts, that they'll leave with something that will change their life. So am I saying that we don't want tongues and interpretation in our main services? No, I don't, I don't have a direction or a, a feeling that we need to do that. What I'm saying is, is we need to be careful of what we think will bring revival and bring people to salvation knowledge of Christ in our services and when we go out there. We need to look at what scripture says is the most impactful thing for the believers versus the unbelievers. Verse 23, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now see, this scripture is a good one to repeat to those who will tell you, well, they thought they were drunk in the Acts account, so we just should expect they'll just think we're drunk, and that's their problem. Praise God, that's even better. That means it was for reals, because people thought we were drunk. We, we were 100% we were for reals. Verse 23 says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? Verse 24, but if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Um, I'm going to repeat a story that we heard at district council. And it does involve a message in tongues, but the interpretation, which was a prophetic one, saved a life. Our speaker, Rick De Boys, uh, DeBose, I always start to mess up his name. He, uh, he spoke last night for the ceremony for the ordination and he told of being in a church where they were in a Pentec they were in an Assembly of God church, and right next door was a Baptist church. And there was a sign in the road that pointed to the Baptist church. And this, uh, the, during this uh, service, there was a message in tongues, and he felt strong in the prophecy, but it was basically, that he told them that the prophecy came to, or the, the interpretation came to him, that there's someone in the room that had planned that if they did not, con if they did not experience God in that service, they were going to kill themselves. He said, he's thinking, it's better be God. And they waited, they prayed, they waited. And finally, he said, way back in a section, uh, he said, if you're here, or whoever you are, you need to make yourself known. And a lady said very 
properly dressed lady. You wouldn't think she had any problems, just in a nice business suit, I think she said, and raised her hand. And he had everybody stand and told her to come down. And that lady, under the power of God, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she was delivered. It said deliverance came to her. And she even brought the gun that she had planned to use. And she said that she actually had grown up Baptist, if I understand and remember the story right, and had planned to go to the Baptist church, but somehow that sign got turned or something was wrong, and she turned in the, Pentecost, in the Assembly of God church instead of the Baptist church. She said, but by the second song, she knew this was not a Baptist church. <laughs> but she knew that it was real. Something was very real that she's hungry for. And God saved her life. And by her words, and we've got good Baptist friends down the, church, down the street, so I'm not, this isn't, love them and they're going to heaven if they believe in Jesus and so we're not going there but I'm just saying that what he she told him was if I had gone in the church I thought to likely that day she'd be dead because she needed to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way she knew she experienced God But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he or she will be convinced by all that she or he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of their hearts will be laid bare. Verse 26, what then shall we say, brothers, when you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word or instruction? Hey, we're good. We're doing worship, so we're good so far. We got it. We, got, we're, we didn't have a hymn. I might have to throw one in there, fit this. No, but, but we have, uh, so a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at, at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should, be, uh, should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Verse 30, and if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophet. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for this is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you, or are you only the people it has reached? We're going to spend time. I'm going to come back to that in another sermon and then help you understand that there's some context there that we need to grasp. There are denominations that have taken that. That is, ver that is exactly, um, I think it was my dad that shared what some theologians believe that there is some specific things to the culture there. They didn't have PA systems and the women sat separate from the men in the back, sometimes even in a balcony and would not be able to hear well the speaker and would yell out to ask questions and it was disrupting the services. Um, so we have to be careful with these scriptures when we read them like that and understand the full context because if we go that route, then there's also some clothing we should not wear. There's food we need to quit eating. There's a whole bunch of things that you'll tell me, pastor, that's the old covenant that's, or that's part of a cultural law. So there, we won't go into it, but there are the laws of the time broken in, the moral law. Um, there, there's different laws that we look at those things. So before anybody takes and runs with that and says... We can't have women's ministry anymore. Just hold up. We'll get to that. Verse, verse 37, if anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. You know, in the story I was telling earlier, one thing I, I missed that uh, our speaker said, he said he, he also qualified that he, he loves Baptist people and there's not 
an issue there, but he said in this particular situation, probably because of the close proximity of the two churches and the differences in beliefs on this subject, that church was known, the Baptist church was known to directly speak against uh, the Baptist Holy Spirit speaking tongues. That was something they spoke about a lot, condemned, and it was something not. So when the lady said, if I went there, I'd likely be dead now, is because there was no way for her to have received that kind of message in, in, through that gifting if she had gone in the other church. Verse 40, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Paul teaches on different ways that the gift of tongues manifest in his own personal spiritual life and in public ministry. Uh, one is at the moment of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we say is the initial physical evidence, that if someone is baptized in the Holy Spirit, so let me explain it to you this way. It's been a while since I, I gave this explanation. So when someone is a sinner and they have not accepted Christ, it requires the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It, it, agree with me with amen. I don't usually need this, but I want to make sure we're following, okay? I don't need you to, a, you can amen all the time if you want, but I don't, I'm not needy like that. But amen me on this so we know. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit is who initially introduces you to Jesus. Is this correct? Okay, don't just be yes people. If I get off here, you need to stop your pastor, all right? We're a small enough group we can discuss. So when the Holy Spirit introduced you to Jesus and you are confronted with the fact that he died for your sins and that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, there's actually an act of baptism, the first baptism, which is salvation, where the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus. Okay, so, so that is, there's actually three baptisms. We always talk about two, but there's three. So the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the life of Christ, and we can go back for scriptural reference at another time. I can't get too much in depth in that right now. But you can do your own research, that first baptism. Secondly, then, what we see is there's a water baptism. So it's a physical act. It, it, it's to identify with Christ with his death, burial, and resurrection. In the Benton County Jail, when... Um, um, yes, Brother Dixon, boy, I have trouble tonight with names. Brother Dixon does that. He'll tell a story uh, that we won't go into about a, an old Western guy who, Elmer, who, uh, who uh, ended up his body when he got shot down by law enforcement, tried to rob a train, all this, that through a course of things, his body got sold into a carnival or a sideshow, and he got painted and fixed up to where people eventually didn't know it was a real body and thought it was just a mannequin until one day on a prop of a movie, I think in the 60s, an arm fell off and, and they panicked because there's human bone in there. And so after, I can't remember how many years, he finally got buried, got a rightful burial. And uh, so Brother Dixon gives a story saying, you know, some of you, you might have accepted Christ, but you've never given the old man a proper burial. And at times, they used to have them take in a rock or something and say, when you go down, leave that in the water. So you come up signifying, I'm leaving that old person behind. So the second baptism is for us to identify, for us to testify to others. It's for accountability from the other believers to say, this person has publicly confessed they're, they're following Christ. It's for that person I have publicly confessed I'm a new person in Christ. And I watch people. In fact, I know and I think of names and faces in my mind immediately when I think about people who have given their heart to the Lord and not been baptized at New Song. And every one of them struggle. More so than others. It's very, it's very uh, interesting that the ones that struggle the most after they make a decision of Christ, uh, others struggle, but almost every time if they refuse to be water baptized. I just don't do that. I can't do that in front of people. So the second baptism, but the third baptism is what we're talking about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is where now the Holy Spirit introduced you to Jesus. You know, he was the comfort. He's the one that was pointing you to Christ and your conviction of your sins. And he baptized you in Christ and into the family of God. And now Jesus says, I need you to understand that there is, there is an endowment of power. So like my disciples, you won't be hiding out in fear for following me and Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. An initial physical evidence of that, we believe, I believe, in the symbol of God in a new song, is the evidence of speaking in tongues. He could have chose other ways, but see, here's the thing. Is some people are like, well, that, they, they discount that. Well, that's just too weird. Why would God do that? Why would God confuse the languages at the Tower of Babel? 
because there was so much power in their unity of communication. If God's gonna give you endowment of power, what can he bring back to you? A unity in communication. You see, we are never meant to speak other languages. In fact, speaking tongues isn't the weird language. English, Spanish, French, those are the weird languages. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence speaking tongues, we're just actually getting reconnected with the power we were meant to have in communication. There's also the use of tongues in devotional prayer. This is where 90% of the time, I, I don't say, they say that's the right way. I don't know. God doesn't move on me every time in services to give a, a, a message in tongues with interpretation, but in my devotional prayer, even in worship, I find that it just rolls out of me because there's times when my heart is heavy and it, it, the Holy Spirit is praying for me through, through tongues or in my devotional prayer. But in public or corporate worship, a worship event, it requires an interpretation for the body, period. That's why if someone gives a message in tongues, we'll stop and we'll wait and we'll wait for the interpretation. We'll wait. And I may not have a beat on whether that was really the Holy Spirit or that person just did something on their own. I don't know. If I have a check in my spirit, I'll address it as, as appropriate. But sometimes I've been in there where there's not an interpretation. I'm not getting it. I'm not going to fake it. Nobody else is apparently getting it. Nobody else. I'll encourage people we need to seek for the interpretation. And at some point, you move on to the service. I always wonder, like everybody else, I wonder what happened. I feel bad for the person that did it because sometimes I know it's a well-intentioned spirit-filled person and I've walked up before and put around the arm and said hey I, I waited and I, I hope are you okay because to me I, I, I feel very invested in when the Holy Spirit uses me in that way and I feel for someone who th the interpretation didn't come I haven't seen it a lot but that's happened sometimes but God's word says we should have an interpretation of someone who was supposed to interpret missed it it's the only thing I can put on it someone was supposed to and they weren't yielding all right, so, you know, when, when we talk about at the moment of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have in Acts 2, the upper room experience, Acts 10, Cornelius' house, uh, Acts 19. We also know that when Paul ran into the, those believers that had, they'd been baptized in water by John 20 years before, they'd become Christ followers, and Paul runs into them and says, hey, when were you filled with the Holy Spirit? And they're like, well, when were you baptized? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. We just know the Baptist John. Oh, wait, wait. we got to stop. We got to fix that, right? Lay his hands on them. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is, this is a evidence to me where some people say, oh, that stopped with the apostles. No, I know Paul was apostle, but here's some guys that apparently it was important that they received it too. So in devotional prayer, uh, prayer we, we may speak in tongues, but that's to edify, be edify ourselves for the Holy Spirit to pray through us, uh, um, Scripture refers to uh, um, moanings or uh, groanings that, that uh, cannot be uttered. But when someone naturally speaks in an earthly language, which he or she has not learned, that also happens. Um, now, there are, there are some errors that, that folks have made on interpreting scriptures, and one that tongues ended as a spiritual gift, as I mentioned, with the death of the apostles. And that is, is indefensible from a scriptural standpoint. You cannot go to scripture and say that it ended with the death of the apostles because we see evidence uh, contrary to that. Um, what happens here is that people who have never experienced tongues reject the, the, the presence of tongues simply because of their experience or lack thereof rather than on scripture. It's the same example I gave you that when I was 14 years old and if the one person you see speaking in tongues all the time is mean, you tend to think that's fake, right? And so what I've said is, you know, God taught me that just because you see the fake first doesn't mean the real doesn't exist. You shouldn't stop, you should not stop seeking God's word for the truth in that just because you see someone who is a bad example of that. I think some people would say that's like saying that only skinny and shaped people should go to the gym, right? So, uh, the other opposite error is when, when we place harsh, legalistic, dogmatic demands upon God. 
and the other people have to have the Spirit of God move to the, the exact same way of everyone everywhere. And in, in other words, in the Pentecostal circles, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not really saved. And that's an error that some of the Pentecostal denominations went to, or at least one, where they equal salvation to the baptism. So you should receive it at salvation, and if you don't, then you're not really saved. And I think I visited one of those churches one time, and they about crushed my head trying to push it into my head. Um, had people on every side praying for me with hands on my head and left there with a headache. But the problem with this is that all folks are different, and God is infinitely creative. And he does things in his own timing and his own way. And as sure as you try to force God into a box, he'll take your box from you. He never seemed to do miracles in the same way every time. Why would he heal one blind man one way and spit in some mud and rub that saliva in another one's eyes? He, he is a creative God. So why would his spirit depart from the rest of his character by interacting with us the, the exact same way all the time everywhere? Why would we expect that? The world in which he created is unpredictable. God is not unpredictable, but because of our sinful nature, we often can't, often can't predict what, what he's going to do. We know by his scripture he doesn't change, right? We know his promises are true. We know certain things. But I can't tell you what he's going to do with me next year. He's unpredictable. Th this last so many years of my life has been a wild ride where there's a lot of things I would have never expected of God to do through me. So Jonathan Watson um, from Belvis Assembly, our current presbyter, um, you know, he gave me some sermons that, that meant a lot to him for me to make my own. And so part of, part of the sermon came from that. And there's an example in there I wanted to give you because it, it was too good. He said, a minister that I know, uh, a Methodist preacher that became hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the AG minister he knew briefly exhorted him and laid hands on him and prayed that he would indeed receive the spirit of baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Um, the Methodist minister raised up his hands and with weeping began to praise God in English and thank God profusely for his profound spiritual experience, but not speaking in tongues. No speaking in tongues happened. Afterward, he asked the AG fellow about the tongue stuff. The minister smiled and said, relax, God's clock is not like man's clock. When God imparts that gift, will you call me and let me know? The next day that man called and said, I went to bed last night and in the early morning I woke up with both hands straight up in the air praying in tongues. So to some of us who have been too quick to discount the gift of tongues, let me encourage you, don't do that. Stop it. The Bible is clear on the subject. Seek the Spirit and don't limit his future movement within you based on your past experiences. I think Brother Robert Morris says when he was uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit that he ended up in his, in, at night, sleep. his wife heard him praying in tongues in his sleep. Doctrinally, uh, theologically, I don't know where you stand on that, but that's what happened for him. And then he was Spirit-filled, but he didn't come from a Spirit-filled background. In fact, he was already a minister, if I remember right. Uh, and then he was filled and changed the course of his ministry. I know that I've told the story before about a neighbor in Nebraska next to our house that was Catholic, at least Catholic in name. Don't know if they really practiced or went, but my mom began to witness to her. And I don't think she had even got to telling her about the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. And she was out hanging her laundry, praising God, got filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues, ran into my mom and said, explain to me what just happened to me. <laughs> And I hear stories of that besides from our family about people who, in seeking God, and that's exactly what happened to me, I was at an altar trying to be filled. I had been at an altar many times as a preteen asking to be filled, and it didn't happen. And I felt frustrated, and I felt like, what's wrong with me? And apparently, I'm not close enough with God. And I went through all the gamut of things we go through. And it was at a moment where I just dug my heels in the altar, said, God, prove to me you're real. I need to know you're real. I am not leaving here until I know that you are real. I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just saying, I need this from you. And then ended up flat on my back, pr 
praise, praising God in tongues. To some of us who have been judgmental of ourselves or others because you thought the Spirit had to move on you or others just like you saw as a child, let me say to you, relax. It's God's business. Let him be in control. Do you know we have new families coming to this church pretty often? And I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with someone who comes from a different denominational background that did not believe like we do. And has just been curious. They want to know. I know what they're really asking. Are you going to pull me up here and everybody going to smash my head too? Maybe they went to the same place I went. I don't, but they don't say those things, but hey, I really want to understand this. They want to know, are you going to expect me to, to do something that I don't feel comfortable with? And to my response to them always is, I want you to come here and experience God and God, not me, God. If you're open to receiving all God has for you, then we're on a good, we're, we're in good. Because you can come here as long as it takes for you to experience God in the way he wants you to experience him. But that's my challenge. You come here hungry, experience God, and the rest will all get taken care of. I said, and if you have a feeling that someone is pressuring you in a way that you don't feel comfortable, come see me because I'm a papa bear when it comes to that with this body. You know, recently someone suggested about having someone come speak here and I had someone else say, hmm, probably not, brother. Um, I know you well enough to know you would probably not be okay with that person <laughs> because they, I guess, had been in a service where this person had really put the pressure on people in, in ways that they know that the papa bear comes out of me. Nothing I could, nothing would bother me worse than having someone come in and bring someone up here who's not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and their first experience with seeking Someone trying to tell them, now say this, now say that, now say this, now say it louder, now say it louder. Now let me just put a little pressure on your forehead because we want you on the ground by the time this is over because that, that's how it's good. I'm telling you, I'm warning you, if that, if, that, if that temptation is in you, don't do it here. Don't do it here. I haven't had to go at it with anybody significantly yet, a new song, but that would, that would bring it out in me. I want them I would, be, I would be ecstatic, not for the purpose of people laying out, because this is a hard floor. But supernaturally, if God protected them, right? We didn't get sued. <laughs> and people are out under the power of God. And revival happens here. I am, I am hungry for that. But it has to be God. It has to be God. It would turn my stomach. And I don't even know if I could stay the pastor if this church ever was against me in this and said, at whatever cost, we're going to make sure we have revival, whether it's real or not. I don't think we ever would say that, but sometimes our motives and the way we go at things can be. Something that rubs me wrong is if we start looking at ministry like it's, it's a business and we start, you know, one of the things I have difficulty sometimes going around a bunch of ministers in meetings is I don't, and I, I'll joke about it and I shouldn't, but, you know, church strategy I get it. We, we have approaches for reaching the lost. And we have different ideas, and it's okay. But I just get worried. I get so concerned. I don't want the motives to start shifting. And for us to start thinking we could just be smart about getting people to follow God's ways without the relationship. It's not what we want. Okay. Let him be in control. You can wound people spiritually and cause them unneeded confusion and grief and shame by speaking for God when God is not speaking himself. Leave some room for God to work in others' lives his own way. Now I'm going to stop and tell you, at the same time, I need to pepper this the other side. So here's the side. Do not try to speak for God when you don't know that God is speaking. On the other hand, don't be so apprehensive about Stepping out in faith when you think he is speaking to you. I was just at an altar with all these ministers after the ordination. We got up and prayed for people. And there's a, I think, well, no, that was the night before. That was Monday night. They had a prayer time. And, it, oh, because we're doing ministry to the Delta area. And there's a lot of really tough areas. I mean, high crime, poverty. And so some of these ministers that are ministering the Delta came up. And I went up and there was this uh, um, just as nice as Brother Bill's hair. I mean, almost. His is pretty nice, but just perfectly white. If, I, if my hair changes color, I want it to be like Brother Bill's. I want it to be just white as can be. And, but this guy's up there, very distinguished looking, 
is next to his wife and, and her hair is all fixed and, and they're very, you can tell very proper, probably decades and decades of, of hard ministry and leading people Lord. Someone you probably want to sit and just take them to lunch and learn from. And I'm praying for them. Well, actually, I'm just praying for everybody up there, but my eyes keep going to the back of this guy's head. And all of a sudden, as clear as, I, as clear as can be, I see this picture of this farm field and there is a boy with a farm hat and overalls with them rolled up barefoot and, and overalls. And not real muscular, I, maybe 14 or 15 years old. And he starts coming off that tractor with the most steely-eyed look and just a flame burning in his chest. Like he, like that guy was going to storm the gates of hell with a water gate. I mean, powerful. I saw it and I thought, there is something powerful about that boy. I was like, oh, that guy doesn't look like he's been near a farm. He's all dressed up. <laughs> I don't know. On his background, I know my, my dad grew up on a farm, and I, I don't know if somebody would say, oh, he looks like he's been on a farm. But I just, I started dealing with this. And I'm like, okay, now that's weird. There's no, I don't have a scripture verse. There's not like a story there. I'm seeing this boy on a tractor, right? But it's a very impressive image, very much so. And I just I thought, oh, yeah. So I'm like, ah, maybe if God gives me more to where it makes sense, I'll go tell him, but I just, that's not enough. And Brother Moore, our general superintendent, which I don't hear him say this, I'll say, some of y'all may have a message for one of these down here and you need to go give it to them or something to that effect. Just as I was about to turn and go, I was like, okay. So then I'm doing the whole thing where I can't get to them and I'm waiting for people to move and I'm feeling kind of sheepish and I'm standing there like a lump, like I got this thing. I'm, and I went up, tapped him on the shoulder. He turned around, his wife turned around. I was like, oh, goodness. I got more nervous when I saw their faces. And I said, I don't normally operate in this gift. And I said, maybe twice in my life I think I've got a vision. And I said, this don't make sense to me. And I'm doing all the pre I said, but while I was praying, I was drawn to you too. And I said, God showed me this boy, maybe 14 or 15, getting off a tractor. And almost looked like old-time days, but I think it was now. He's just an old tractor and I said, my dad's got an old tractor, and I've got, I'm, I hear about tractors a lot, so I, I'm trusting that God's really putting something in here. I just don't know, but I just got to tell you because I almost walked away. But he had a flame in his chest, and I mean a steely look in his eye, and he started coming off that tractor, and it's like I knew when his feet hit the ground something was going to happen. And they just looked at each other, and they said, well, we've been praying about something, and we believe that's confirmation. So I don't know. You know, we don't know. So while I tell you, know that God is telling you, you also, if he nudges you and you're over here on this other side, it's like, no, I'm, I'm not worried about doing it when, I, I don't want to be over there past CJ, that's why I don't do it. I don't want to be the one that does it wrong because you talk about how, you know, don't ever do this wrong or you'll deal with me. I don't want you to think that. It, there's a difference in intent. There are some people who they are bold and brazen enough or not wise enough, whatever it is, that they will take the things of God and put on and, and put on act to bring glory to themselves. And that's what I was talking about, about don't do that. We'll, we'll have trouble. Big trouble, little China with Pastor CJ. <laughs> but if you've not operated any of those gifts, how will you ever know if it's God if you don't step out in faith and try? Here I am, I'm your pastor. I believe in this. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I almost walked away. I didn't even really care whether I got confirmation. I just knew that it was hard enough to tell them and after that I was walking away, it was God's. I, I tell folks now, I, if God gives you a word for someone, don't worry about whether it's confirmed or not. Just be certain in your heart that God's prompting you to do it and just take that chance. You don't have to fish out of them and put them in a spot where it's, hey, does that sound right? Does this sound familiar? Is this kind of hitting on something? Don't do that. It cheapens it. If they turn around and say, that's exactly what I was needing to hear from God, great, awesome, he encouraged you. But just be faithful. Just be bold, be courageous, be faithful, and step out and do it. Leave some room for God to work in others' lives in his own way. All right. I want to finish with a couple things. We, we should not require of others what God does not require of them. Um, a couple quick things. We talk about tongues in private devotion, prayer. 
Um, we also, public proc proclamation, tongues with interpretation. And also, when a person prays in tongues and God gives a real language, which is recognized by people who actually know the language, that is something amazing too that I've heard accounts of. Um, one of the best stories that Pastor Jonathan also included this one, one of the best stories that he had heard was uh, happening at uh, Mount Perrin Church of God where the pastor gave an utterance of tongues and someone responded with a prophetic word for the congregation. And at the end of the service, there were three Chinese students who came up so excited that the pastor would greet them so warmly and welcome in their native dialect. The pastor had no idea what had happened and the students reported that he had welcomed them, each one personally, into God's house. It is a miracle and a gift of God to the church. But I don't understand, just welcome them? Like, okay, so the Holy Spirit's now gonna help us with our hospitality, greeting people. He's also gonna give us a message in tongues for filling out the visitor's cards. No, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to belittle it. I'm saying, listen, God will do it in his own way for whatever purpose. And in that situation, it was something to help the um, it was something to help the unbelievers believe. And that moment, the believers were encouraged. The whole body was edified. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're hoping for. So in the last few minutes, this is what I want to do. You don't have to come up here. If you want to come up here, you can. But I think we need to start with first things first. I'm going to make the assumption that we all need more desire for this gifting. Listen, listen, church. I know all of you. I know these little ones. I know these little ones are faithful to these altars. I'm just going to say this. We all need more of what God has for us. And if the desire is not there, ask him for the desire too. Ask him for the desire, not for purpose of a new song, not so we can brag about something going on here. If you go home and things break loose in your prayer closet and you go out on the streets and all of a sudden revival breaks out on the streets and you're like, Pastor CJ, God's telling me to start another church over here because there's a revival happening. If, if God's in it, he's doing it. I'm not standing in the way. But I'm just telling you, it's not about our church alone. It's about each and every one of us connecting with God so that the whole body can be built up. The whole body, beyond new song, every church. So let's pray. Just spend some time with him. I'm going to pray out loud for a few moments, and then I'm going to get quiet. I'll come back in a few moments, give a formal dismissal, but you can continue after that formal dismissal. I just want to give a moment where everyone knows if you need to go, you can. Jesus, we come to you. Lord, we know that through your Holy Spirit, that he can do amazing things through us, Lord, but some of us may have either never been baptized in your Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues. Because of that, we don't have the prayer language in our private time. Or, Lord, there's, there's things that, that that gift is useful, but it has to be you, and we, we determine that tonight from your word. It has to be you. God, it's also easy just to hear another sermon. And even how people see me can affect how they receive this word. And the danger in that, God, is I have nothing to do with the truth of your word. The truth of your word is exactly what it is. It's truth for every life. So I pray that whatever hindrances may have been there that would keep us from truly seeking you right now for your gifts, I pray that in Jesus' name they be wiped away. That we can receive from you Lord, my journey's not just on this night for the point of this message until the next time we come around and speak about this. You know, my journey, my heart is every day, Lord. Empty me so you can fill me. Empty me so you can fill me. Take everything out of the way that is holding me back so that you can fill me. Lord, I'm tired of almost the psychotic thoughts in my head of, of why why, Lord, can I not break through here? Why can I not, just the frustrations and the, and the, the turmoil we go through, Lord, why, why am I not drawing closer to you? And Lord, many times I believe we just have too much in the way. Your, your Holy Spirit, he's, he's doing a work, but we're not allowing those things to be removed. We're not asking you to help us in, in our desire for it. We're just going day by day, hoping one day it just happens to us. 
So Lord, I pray right now as we spend time in our own thoughts and prayers, meditation with you, help us to desire the gifts of your Holy Spirit. after this is just be after the time that you feel released. Jesus, I pray tonight, God, that you'll continue this conversation through your word into our lives. You'll draw us back to these passages and draw us back to this time tonight, which you spoke in our hearts. And that God, that this isn't the end, but the, but the beginning of the beginning, Lord. But for those who, who are thirsty and, and hungry, Lord, for more of you, continue to seek, Lord, that you may be able to give them the gifts that you have planned for them, for them to operate regularly in those gifts, Lord, as you give them the power to do so. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.